at the uh, Larry Hackett Post 72, Saugerties, New York, on Sunday, November 7th, 2004, uh, at uh, 10.45 a.m. And, um, Alan, what is your birthday? July 20th, 1955. And uh, your current address? 13 Bernier Lane, Saugerties, New York. Also attending the interview are Alan's daughter, Nikia Grzynski, and Big Mac McElroy. We'll see how that went. Okay. Drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted in the Coast Guard in uh, December 1973. And where were you living at the time? Queens, New York. In fact, I enlisted out in uh, Freeport, Long Island. And uh, when we went to boot camp, it was in Cape May, New Jersey. Very cold, January. And freezing cold. We arrived there about 1 o'clock in the morning. It was completely pitch dark. Why did you join? Combination of, uh, I was going to get the GI Bill. Uh, I guess a bit of patriotism, you know, you do your part. Uh, at that time, it wasn't really looked on as like too, uh, you were looked on as like, you know, they, a lot of people questioned your sanity if you joined the service at that time. It was the end of the Vietnam conflict. So. What, uh, why did you pick uh, that branch of the service? It was, uh, I was going to go Army Engineers, and my father had a friend of his that was in the Coast Guard. He says, um, why don't you go, he says, we've been engineering, which was in, actually the engine room, uh, and uh, that's, that's why I wound up joining uh, the Coast Guard for their machinist technician. What was your first day in the service like, first day? It was 2 o'clock in the morning. It was cold, freezing, and it was at Cape May. It was wind blowing. It was, they just hurried us into a barracks with about 300 other guys in, in, in the squad bay. What did it feel like? We were packed in there like sardines in a can, and uh, it, was a, it was a unique experience, I'll say. I'll, I'll call it that. Tell me more about it, your boot camp training. Um, it was, ours was the second longest from the Marines. The Marines were 16, and ours was 11 weeks, Coast Guard. Coast Guard had the second longest. And that was because they had uh, I, a lot more small boat training than like the Navy had. Most of the Navy ships were all big. Coast Guard, you had a lot of, uh, you had two weeks of, uh, we had a week of firefighting and then a week of uh, small boats, taking out 30 foot boats out at the, De the Delaware Bay, basically. And then we also went up to Wildwood, and it was cold, freezing again. This was in February 1974. And, uh, a lot of toppy weather, so we went through these little 30 foot boats, and they had them filled with like eight and ten guys, each one doing navigation, basic, just basic, basic ship familiarity. Ship familiarity. Would be the best words to say for. Do you remember your instructors? Oh yeah, we had uh, Chief Sittler. It was like uh, Hitler, but with an S. And uh, we had uh, Chief Chambers, who was a, he was he was pretty much of a maniac. We had an ex Navy SEAL, B M two, George George C Marshall. He had the same name as the World War Two general. He was an ex Navy SEAL, and they specialized him as being the recruit uh, DI. So it was, uh, he was he was another another interesting character. But uh, after that, was uh, I went on to machinist school, which was in Yorktown. Yorktown, Virginia, very nice. The whole tidewater area was beautiful. It was in early, the end of winter, the early spring, and I went through there until the end of August. I was there, and then I got sent to the Evergreen after that, which was ice breaking oceanographic. And uh, we also tested out a lot of uh, sonar for the Navy because we worked with the underwater uh, system center over in London, Connecticut. So we went on a lot of. Uh, sort of war games with the submarines to test out their sonar and uh, we had towed a raid sonar that we could pick them up and you know, various stuff like that. Then we had a couple of four ice patrols where we went up to the land of Labrador, the coast of Greenland. Very desolate, desolate area of the earth. So amazing it's in the size of it. It's just you know, hundreds and hundreds of miles, not even a village. So it was an interesting time and when that was over September 76 I got out and it was uh, Tulsa County Community College for a few years. And you mentioned that uh, that you were up in the Arctic Circle area there, mm -hmm. and uh, they had a lot of state storms and so forth. No, yeah, yeah. Tell did, us about that. Oh, we did a couple of trips to the Caribbean also, and uh, that's actually, we got, we got a, one diller of a storm, which uh, I'll never forget it. It took off, it, we got hit with a wave, and it uh, took off the small boat, we had a small lave on, and on the fan, well, under the fan, it was up on the damage control shack, and we had a P-250, which was a firefighting pump, and Oh, about five, five, each five-gallon cans of gas that just got swept over, but spilt the gasoline all over. We went to general court, even though we thought we were going to have a fire. So it was, a, it was an interesting, uh, 
Did you have many casualties? People get hurt? A couple of people got mainly just banged around. You know, in fact, I got like one of the hatches slammed on my hand one time. It didn't break anything. I was surprised. Uh, just black and blue. And uh, one time we took we took another wave, and I was taking a water sample. And I'll never forget this. The hot water spilled right on my arm. Took the took the took the hair right off. It was all chromated water, which was to keep the you know the engines from rusting. They were they were diesel electric. The two big Cooper Bessemer engines, which propelled the uh, generators, and that propelled the motor. Only one main motor. But she was an older ship. She was built in World War II. This was in 74, 75, 76. She was built in 43 up in Duluth, Minnesota. And uh, during World War II, she took a lot of supplies up to Greenland. So the Evergreen was always in the North Atlantic. We did have an interesting time. We went over the Titanic, which was in March of 76. And uh, we scanned the bottom. We did find something large on there, but um, I, I wrote to my captain, and he was supposed to. He was supposed to look through uh, his records and see if we actually we were in the same area where the Titanic had, was lost. But uh, it was the only thing that was on the bottom that was big enough that would come up on our sonar. And again, ours was nothing like Ballard had ten years later when they actually you know, when they had the submarines to go down there and find it. So. I remember one time you told me you were involved in a Marielle boat lift. 1980. Yeah. I was working for the post office about a week and they called me up to go to, uh, down to New Jersey. Well, actually, it was supposed to be Cuba. But then they, then they changed it to Florida, and then they finally changed it to New Jersey. You were in the Coast Guard State. Reserve at that time? It was in the Reserves, mm -hmm. and we were relieving the uh, regular patrol boats, the, the old 95-foot uh, coastal patrol boats. We had uh, 82 and 95. A lot of the 82s they gave to the South Vietnamese. Tell us and, more about uh, what was the Marielle boat lift about? Well, well How Cast did it happen? Castro had uh, basically, he had emptied his jails, and uh, they... Uh, just sent everyone over here, just loaded them on boats and, you know, told them, yeah, you're, you're going to be free in the United States. Of course, you know, this is the criminals and the dredges of uh, Cuban society. And there was a lot of people that just wanted to get away from Castro, too. And, you know, I mean, if I was involved, then I'd, I'd want to get out of there also. So um, that was in 1980. And it was in June. It was at the end of June, beginning yeah, it was just the end of June and for three weeks. I had been involved in that. How did you do that with the Mario Bowler? We just, actually, I just relieved the regulars. They gave them like an extra uh, 30 days off because they had been at sea so long. So we just took the patrol boats and went up and down the coast. And we tried to pick up refugees, was that it? Yeah, but we didn't even see any Cubans or anything like that. It was just, we were just up and down the coast of Jersey. Uh, you had mentioned that uh, you were awarded uh, certain medals and citations and so forth for your service? Just national defense, and, uh, and they gave the, medal for the Coast Guard medal for when they activated us. It was the biggest activation between Korea and uh, the, Gulf, the first Gulf War. For the Marielle Boatman. For, for the Marielle Sea, mm -hmm. for, by the Coast Guard. It was the Commandant who had, uh, President Carter gave the authorization of the Commandant to activate reserve units, so they had activated us. And, so I went off to Jersey, and then I did a week in, um, in Connecticut on the Cape Fairweather, another 95-foot coastal patrol boat. Now, after you left the Coast Guard service, you returned to civilian life. Right. And eventually you became a member of the uh, National Guard? National Guard. After they closed our reserve unit out up in Albany, and going to Governor's Island was, was a long haul down from Ravina every, you know, every once a month. So what I did is I, right in Lee's, the 10th Mountain Division Infantry, and I said, well, I was like hiking and camping, and so I <laughs> joined the 10th Mountain Division for a year. I was with them. So. You achieved the rank of Staff Sergeant? Yeah, I, they t let me take my E6 from the Coast Guard. Mm -hmm. In fact, I was just about ready to make E7. I was getting ready to make Chief of the Coast Guard, and uh, it was in, I left in February 83, and if I had stayed in, I would have I passed the test, everything. If I would have just waited my time, I would have been Chief. I would have been E7 in June of 83. When you were in the, the service uh, uh, in the Coast Guard, how did you keep in touch with your family? Uh, well, we were in port. I could, you know, I could call, but you know, I would drop them letters of, from Newfoundland. And I called, uh, in fact, I called a young lady in Socrates for a date from <laughs> from Newfoundland. It was like six dollars, which was like an astronomical amount back 30 years ago. But um, you know, it was mostly you know either writing or just when you were in port, you could call. So you know, we had. We would be out for three, four weeks, five weeks sometimes, and I think one time we were out for seven weeks, and then we came back. And then we, we were, weren't in port that long, we were in port maybe like two weeks, and we'd be back out on another ice patrol, and we'd be down the Caribbean, we'd get a couple of Caribbean. I went to, we went to Bermuda twice, I went there in August of 75, and January of 76. 
and the Bahamas, and we were supposed to stop in Haiti. I'm glad we didn't. And uh, we went to we went to Florida. That might be <laughs> Fort Lauderdale. I know. It was in June of uh, seven o'clock. Overall, what was the food like in the Coast Guard? Oh, good, good. Uh, most of our cooks were uh, Filipinos. Very good, at, especially at fish. They guys were fantastic. In fact, we went. A couple of the chiefs coming back from an ice patrol off of Labrador. They went fishing. We caught fresh fish, and we had quite a uh, quite a luau. We messed that. It was really a pretty interesting, uh, interesting time. I'll never forget it. So you augmented your supplies by fishing. By fishing, yeah. It was the fishing boat. We had the well, we had the sonar and stuff for it. So we <laughs> very sporting. Yes, it was. Well, and of course, you always had enough supplies of everything. I take it. Oh yeah. Sometimes we ran out, and they dropped the C one thirty stuff. One time we had to find these Navy underwater sound buoys. They wanted to pick them up before the Russians picked them up. And um, we stayed out another like two weeks, two and a half weeks. So they just supplied us with, we barely made it back with the fuel uh, right at the St. John's. But uh, this Coast Guard C-130s dropping the stuff from the low, low altitude parachute extraction. The parachute pulls the gear, everything out of it. It was on big orange floats. So we would go up small boats, pick it up, and bring it back. And most of it was all food, ice cream, everything. So the C-130 would drop the skid in the sea? In the sea. And you'd recover it from the sea? Yeah, from the sea. We'd take the small boats out and load everything in there. And then they were just they were basically like inflatables. They were just big inflatable balls that held everything up. That, uh, so then we'd pick everything right back on. And the wood you could almost chop up and throw it just a pallet, basically. And everything else was tied to a wooden plastic bag so we wouldn't get wet. To bring it on board the ship so we at least have another week's supply of food. So. Did you feel pressure or stress while you were serving? A couple of storms. We had, uh, as I said, we had the one storm which tore off the, the Avon and uh, some of our gear. And another time, one of our, the Coke machine broke free in the mess deck and it was flying around. And uh, that was, that was, that was, it took like eight of us to get it back to secure it and tie it back up again. But it was mainly like we went, we went through one storm right after another and we were just. You couldn't even sleep sometimes, you'd just be tied in your rack because you, she was only 180 feet long and everybody and it rolled like a bathtub and then they battered that thing to pieces. Did you have a fear that the ship might sink? No, she was a pretty seaworthy ship and we had our, our boats were the self-inflatable ones so you, I mean, you had you know emergency gear and that. No, I didn't think the Evergreen was, uh, I don't think she would ever sink. I was more afraid of a fire or something because you know she had a lot of fuel and stuff and we were always, always loaded. <laughs> you know, with the gasoline you know, up on, for, the, for the small boats up on the up on the fantail, I was only afraid of something taking off there. In fact, we had a small electrical fire in a battery room, but it wasn't anything really big. We put it out in like five minutes, not even that. Two minutes, it was out. So. Did you um, did you um, have a uh, occasion to have any fear or pressure while you were in the Tenth Mountain Division? Oh no, that was Tenth Mountain Division was just it was uh, it was just National Guard. We didn't do do anything that was you know anything. That was, no riots or anything like that, or any you know, law enforcement type thing. It was, it was just strictly a training. A lot of people go to sea and they have some kind of sort of superstitions or things they do for good luck. Did you have anything like that? Not me. A couple other guys. Uh, I know. I know ships don't have thirteen in them, and I know sailors are very superstitious. Uh, uh, as one of our one of our boatswain mates used to say, he, in fact, he, he had almost he was former Navy, almost went on the pueblo. I never forget, never forget him. He always used to say, um, he says, there's only, there's only uh, uh, two ships that are good to a sailor, the one he was on and the one he's going to. And the, the one he's presently on, he stinks. <laughs> he can't stand it. So. What do people do to entertain themselves? We had a lot of movies, B movies. Uh, <laughs> terrible, terrible movies. Most of the time I would play chess, uh, the radio man, our, our Chief Radio and I we used to hang out with HS and our chief electronic technician. I used to go up to the dry lab. That's where I first got into computers. Uh, we had this old Honeywell Octal read out computers. I mean, ancient history today. But uh, that was, uh, you know, and it was cutting edge technology at that time, 1976. But uh, there was, uh, instead of watching any of the B movies, they had jumped from Hollywood. Wow, terrible, terrible stuff. Did you ever have any kind of entertainment shows or USO no, shows or anything? No, uh, no, they, they, uh, no, no. We were too small and too in too a remote corner of the world for anything like that. So. And uh, you mentioned a number of places that you did travel while you were in service. Did you get a chance to do shore leave or anything like that? Oh yeah, we went, yeah. yeah, we went to we went to a little town in Nova Scotia called Picture. Really, really, I mean, a 
Canadian Norman Rockwell town, fantastic. We were guests of honor, us and a Canadian destroyer, the Marguerite. And uh, we were the guests of honor at the Lobster Festival. They don't have the 4th of July, but they have the 4th and 5th and 6th of July is a lobster festival up in Nova Scotia. So it was quite a, it was, it was neat. It was really, it was really impressive. They had in Halifax. Halifax is a very, very clean city. Uh, New, St. John's Newfoundland is a little bit more remote, much more rugged or uh, rugged, not rugged or rugged. Uh, really uh, like a real frontier type town on the edge of the Arctic. So. Do you remember any particularly humorous event, or did uh, the, uh, did the Coast Guard uh, personnel play pranks on each other? Oh no, we had 